Hi, I'm Jonathan. Um, a lot of you are probably running a lot of infrastructure already in your organization, or you want to think about running various uh, other pieces of infrastructure, and I'm going to tell you about how TensorFlow fits into that. So, the clicker. Thank you. So um, first, I'm going to talk about all the steps you go from uh, from training to serving a model in production. And it typically involves these three steps. Usually, the raw data that you have isn't fit for training yet, so you have to do some form of data preparation. After that, you do training, um, and then you serve your model. So for data preparation, uh, there are three essential steps that are involved in data preparation. So you'll Im import the data from various sources. This might be Hive, MySQL, and so on. Um, you'll typically perform some sort of pre-processing on the data. You'll compute aggregates or do joins. Um, and then you'll export the file in a file format supported by TensorFlow, and I'll explain that a bit later. So um, a lot of people have been using typically these three things for doing this process, Spark, Hadoop, MapReduce, or Apache Beam. Um, and it works well with all of these at the moment. And as, as a visual example, um, we have, you know, you're feeding in data from MySQL, say it's user data, and you have data in Hive. Um, an example might be web impressions or web clicks. You want to join that data, compute aggregates like uh, user data per region. Um, often you'll do vocabulary generation, particularly if you're using embeddings. Um, you'll, vocabulary generation essentially means like, mapping from words to IDs, and the IDs uh, map to an embedding layer, uh, embedding. And then after that, you'll typically have a training test split. And after this process, you'll output to a file format that TensorFlow understands. And why, why might you want to do this? So um, the, the input file format that you use with TensorFlow actually matters quite a bit. So one example is, suppose you're training inception on P100 GPUs. You want to keep the P100 saturated. Actually, one of the most important things you can do to make that work well is work on your input pipeline. And that involves working with queues. There are tutorials on the TensorFlow website. But uh, specifically, in this case, I'll talk about file formats. Some file formats are faster than others. We have specifically optimized the path for working with uh, TF example and TF sequence example protocol buffers. Sequence example uh, is typically used when you're training with RNNs. And TF records is a, a TensorFlow specific file format that uh, we use with TensorFlow. And this is by far the fastest. We've, like, we use this internally, and we've optimized this path pretty well. Additionally, TensorFlow also natively has ops to support reading from various file formats like CSV, JSON, fixed record, length files. Um, we have upcoming support for Avro. Um, so you can use those. Those are a little slower, but since they're native ops, they actually work pretty well. More commonly, people, if you like read examples of TensorFlow code on the web, people will be feeding data directly in Python. And this is by far the most common. It's the easiest to experiment with. It also has the most flexibility, meaning that you, um, you can use any file format that Python natively can understand and then convert it to NumPy arrays, which can be fed as tensors in TensorFlow. It's also useful for settings like reinforcement learning, but it's also the slowest option. So if, if you're running experiments, this makes sense. But if you're trying to uh, productionize a pipeline and you care about training speed, then you might want to consider switching to the first option. Um, OK, I, I'd like to mention actually why it's, it's a bit slower. There are two things that are involved. Um, reading from specific file formats using in Python itself may not be too fast. So you have that part. And then uh, when converting from Py, NumPy arrays to uh, TensorFlow tensors, there's a copy involved, and that induces additional overhead. So I've recommended TF record support. Hopefully, at this point, you're convinced. And how well does it work? So Apache Beam, as of a few weeks ago, actually has native support for uh, this file format. But a lot of you aren't, aren't running Apache Beam. And you'll be running Hadoop and MapReduce and Spark jobs already. And you just want to use that. So if you go to the ecosystem repository in the TensorFlow GitHub organization, we have code to, make, uh, to work with TF records there. Note that I didn't mention protocol buffers at all. Protocol buffers actually has native support for a lot of the languages you would be using. OK, so now that you've exported this uh, training data, you want to go to training. 
there are two common ways of doing training. One is, you know, say you have a GPU on your desktop or laptop, you want to do local training. Uh, this works well for the specific, specific cases of debugging or working with smaller data sets. But uh, as Megan mentioned in the intro talk, um, distributed training, like 64 GPUs, you actually get a 58x speed up in images processed per second if you run on distributed, like in a just dis distributed setting with 64 GPUs versus one GPU. So you train much faster. And for a lot of people in your organization, this could mean the difference of taking a month to train a model versus taking a day. And the, the feedback loop is pretty important to make machine learning well work well in your organization. So there are two essential components if you want to start with distributed training in your organization. Uh, Derek was talking about cluster managers. We've, we know organizations that have been using all of these to make a distributed TensorFlow work well. So we'd recommend any of these. Um, by Hadoop here, I mean Hadoop Yarn. And uh, so we actually have configuration examples for Kubernetes and Mesos specifically in the ecosystem repository. So if you're already running that, then you can get started pretty quickly that way. But in addition to a cluster manager, you should also be running uh, distributed storage. Derek was talking about this a little bit, but these are the ones that we work with. We added HDFS support in TensorFlow 0.11. Um, TensorFlow also has native support for reading from Google Cloud Storage. And if you're running on Amazon's cloud service, then uh, users have reported working, it working well with Amazon EFS. So the reason you would want to run distributed storage is mostly because um, for two reasons. For your input data, so each worker can read from a single source, and for output for your model, so for checkpoints and the exported model itself. So containers are completely optional, but highly recommended. So containers isolate your workers from their environment. And one reason this is useful is because uh, certain jobs might have certain version dependencies that might differ from other jobs. And a specific example here is eventually we'll release TensorFlow 2.0. TensorFlow uses semantic versioning. And at 2.0, we may ha make some backwards incompatible changes. And suppose you want to upgrade to TensorFlow 2.0 in your organization, then um, the containers make it much easier to do gradual updates, because you don't have to upgrade every job at once. You can just update jobs. Um, you can pin the jobs to a particular TensorFlow version and update e each one one by one. So getting started with containers makes sense. Uh, Docker is supported in both Mesos and Kubernetes, and uh, we recommend that. <clears throat> so as a refresher for what Derek was talking about, um, I'm going to show you what distributed training uh, code looks like or as a refresher of what Derek mentioned and what configuration um, involves. So there, there are essentially two, two types of jobs that you have, um, parameter servers and workers. And Derek mentioned that the most common setup and the setup that we recommend is between graph replication. And in that case, workers operate completely independently. So the workers don't necessarily talk to each other or even know about each other. Um, they only communicate with the parameter servers. And for that, Derek actually showed this, but across multiple slides. Um, this is the code involved if you're using core TensorFlow. We, with the higher level APIs, a lot of this goes away and becomes much fewer lines of code. But in essence, um, your cluster manager specifies all the other parameter servers and workers that this worker must communicate with. You start a server. If you're a parameter server, you just stop there. But if you're a worker, then you need to assign variables to uh, parameter servers and uh, set the worker device so that this graph belongs on this particular worker. So configuration really depends on which cluster manager and which distributed storage system you chose. We have examples, again, in that repository that I mentioned, the ecosystem repository. And we're adding more. And feel free to contribute any that uh, you know that work well in your existing infrastructure. Additionally, I'd like to mention that Yahoo recently open sourced code to run on Spark. And why is this useful? Because you, you might think that Spark is like a data processing framework. Um, why would it be useful to run on Spark rather than a cluster manager? So Spark actually has support for running on Mesos, Yarn, or in standalone mode. And a lot of you will already have, be running Spark you know, in, in your organization. And this actually might be the easiest way to get started. And for sure, um, it's difficult to run distributed TensorFlow on Hadoop Yarn. And for sure, it's much easier to get started if you're running Spark on top of Yarn than to try to run distributed TensorFlow on Yarn uh, directly. So I'd recommend this 
in specific cases where you're already running Spark. And Dandelion talked about TensorBoard. Um, you might wonder, how do you, how do you use this with distributed training? So with distributed training, typically you have output, which are summaries and events that go to a directory that you, you specified on distributed storage. Um, the, all you need to do to run TensorBoard is run the TensorBoard command and point it to that distributed storage directory. It will start an HTTP server locally that you can just look at. You can look at your losses. You can go through the embedding visualizer, and all that stuff works. So like, I, I've skipped a lot of steps here. Like, Suppose you, you need to do hyperparameter tuning and so on, but suppose you're already done with all of that, and you're happy with your model. You want to export it and serve in production. So currently, we have two common ways of doing that, but in the long term, it will be one. We, we highly recommend you go with save model. It's going to be the standard file format for TensorFlow going forward. And the advantage to save model over everything else is that it includes all the assets you need to serve your model in production. I mentioned that uh, vocabularies are pretty common for embeddings. And uh, you use a specific vocabulary at training time. You want to make sure to use the exact same vocabulary at serving time. It includes all those files for you. So um, the other advantage to save model is it's a bunch of graphs, and you can specify which one you want to use for a particular use case. GraphDef right now is pretty common in particular uses, particularly on mobile. So uh, the, in, in the mobile example, you typically freeze your variables into constants in your TensorFlow graph. The advantage to GraphDef right now is that uh, GraphDef is actually a protocol buffer which acts as like a single file. So you only have to distribute a single file. That's much easier to deploy. Um, but that advantage is going away. As of recently, you can also freeze a save model. So hopefully you've exported the save model. You want to you want to serve it. Noah, the subsequent talk is actually going to go much more into TensorFlow serving, and um, I'm only going to talk about the top two here: uh, TensorFlow serving and in-process TensorFlow. So these are both options for serving your TensorFlow model after you've exported it, um, but. They're quite different. TensorFlow serving in its typical mode runs as a separate service that you make RPCs to. Um, so why might you choose one over the other? So uh, Noah's going to go much more in depth here, but uh, serving a model actually has a lot of hidden nuance that you might not be aware of when you just think about it. So um, if you're just deploying a model as a one-off, then it might make sense to just use in-process TensorFlow. But um, if you think about you know, like suppose you have a job that trains every day on new data, and you want to serve a new model every day. How might you uh, start serving that new model? <coughs> there, you can you can think about it. There's like two basic ways that might happen. In your server, you can unload the completely unload the old model, and then wait for that to finish. Wait for all requests to finish, and load your new model. This is memory efficient because you only have one model loaded at a single time. Or you can simultaneously load the new model while it's running and double your memory usage. Uh, TF Serving offers that as a configuration option. Um, additionally, uh, for efficiency, particularly if you're serving on GPUs, you want to batch your inputs. Th this also have some, has some benefit on CPUs, but particularly if, if you're serving on GPUs, you want to batch to fully utilize your GPUs. Uh, as you can imagine, there's some nuance to how you want to batch, particularly in low latency settings. So uh, TF Serving handles that. Um, also, if you're serving multiple models, isolation between those models, th they're going to contend for hardware resources, and uh, it's, there, there's some difficulties in isolating between them. Uh, particularly in TensorFlow, you have to think about uh, which threads, like how, how to size thread pools and so on. Um, you don't have to think about that if you're on TensorFlow serving at all. So that's the next talk. Now that I've explained all the benefits, you're like, OK, then wh why not I just use that all the time? Why should I use in-process TensorFlow at all. So in-process TensorFlow is uh, actually the standard mode for certain things. Specifically, if you're running on a mobile device, um, Pete actually went over this. Basically, you have a TensorFlow session, and, and you run it. If you're running batch inference, like if you already have a TensorFlow model, you have a ton of data, and you want to run inference over that data using Beam or Spark, then it's much better to just use in-process TensorFlow than to start another TF-serving service. Um, there's a specific case of very strict latency requirements where you don't want to do the RPCs back and forth with uh, t TensorFlow serving, um, but this is a very rare case. Usually the latency involved there is very small. Um, operationally speaking, it's much easier to run one service than to run two. 
So if you want to simplify your deployments, that's also a reason to do this. But regardless of which one you choose, the two, first two steps between them is practically the same. You want to export your saved model, make it accessible, and then you have to write the code to do inference. And I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. For in-process TensorFlow, you have the additional step of linking to the TensorFlow shared library, which we actually uh, distribute. And you, you can see that in our Go and Java instructions. And you can just download it right there. Or you can build it yourself. So here's a Go example of what inference looks like. It's actually not too much code at all. And actually, if you go to the um, Go repository on GitHub, you can actually see uh, real inception code that works in Go. So what it involves is uh, first loading your save model. You pass the directory that the save model is in. Um, as I mentioned before, save models involve mul multiple TensorFlow graphs. So after, after you specify the directory, there is a list of set of tags that you can use to specify which TensorFlow graph you want to load. When you execute your model, all of you are probably already familiar with uh, TensorFlow sessions if you've ever used TensorFlow at all. It's uh, essentially the same thing as the Python API, but in another, another language. You take a tensor. Here we have a batch of images. And you run, it, run, run your TensorFlow model using that tensor. And as output, you get a, uh, probabilities for each classification uh, for each image in the batch. And you do something with it. <clears throat> so I showed Go there. Um, Jeff mentioned that we support a ton of different languages. These languages are all on our uh, TensorFlow GitHub repository. So you can actually just go to the TensorFlow GitHub repository and start using any of these. Um, all of these languages can actually be used to build and execute TensorFlow graphs. But a common question is, can, these, can any language besides Python be used for training? And uh, the answer is a bit nuanced, but the short of it is no. And the reason is because a lot of supporting libraries, like the training libraries, um, the high-level APIs, optimizers, uh, the RNN library, all of those are only available in Python at the moment. So I would personally recommend that you only do training in Python, but you can do inference in any of these other languages. Um, the instructions for using the shared library are in the readmes that are associated with each language. So you can either download it or build it yourself. Um, I won't go into too much detail here. So as a summary, so th these are the basic steps. You're probably running infrastructure already around it. Um, the point I want to emphasize here is that, uh, especially if you have a lot of data in your organization, you really should be thinking about how to make distributed training work well and what you should be running to, to do that. Um, as Megan said, there's like a 58x speed up when running on 64 GPUs. And you can imagine what kind of like effect that would have on the engineers working with uh, TensorFlow models, or training TensorFlow models. And thank you. Thank you.